Everybody is busy, we know that, but nobody is more busy than our next guest. Uh, she's a busy volunteer, she's a broadcaster, she's the founder and CEO of Spirit North, an organization working to improve the lives of Indigenous children and youth through the transformative power of sport and play. Now working across five provinces, reaching over 6,000 Indigenous children and youth annually, Spirit North is recognized as one of Canada's leading sport for social development organizations. On top of that, she's recognized globally for, for her advocacy and work on behalf of athletes' rights and clean, fair, doping-free sport. She's an Olympic champion, but I'm going to say most importantly, she is a mom to two children, Tio and Bryn. Please welcome our guest, Becky Scott. Microphones, there we go, they're both on, perfect. Okay, thank you, Becky. Now, uh, we changed it up a little bit. We're doing this because Becky's a busy mom and she has to get back to Canmore for an event with the kids. So uh, we adapt what we can as us moms. I want to start with your organization. Um, you know, what inspired you to start Spirit North? So I, um, when I retired from cross-country skiing, as my career in cross-country skiing in 2006, I was invited to come and take part in a sport day at a, at a reserve in northern Alberta. I, like most Canadi non-Indigenous Canadians, had never set foot on a reserve or a Métis settlement. And although I had a little bit of a background in sport for development, having been an ambassador for Right to Play, and I, I knew the, the power of sport and play, especially for vulnerable and marginalized populations. And I, but I did not expect to see what I did on a First Nations reserve, which was eye-opening and um, heartbreaking, to be honest. The disparity of opportunity for the kids there, the incredible rates of obesity, diabetes, uh, substance abuse, and then of course, um, most tragically, the, the rates of depression and suicide among the, that population. Um, what I also discovered there, though, was the transformative power of sport and play, which we both know well from right to play. And so when we started skiing and going out in the schoolyard and taking part in the games with the kids, I saw laughter and light and joy in a population of children that don't often experience that or don't necessarily always have that opportunity. So that was the inspiration, that was the spark for it, and it grew from there. We started with four communities in northern Alberta, and about 250 children. We're now in five provinces across the country and reaching about 6,000 kids annually. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, this is an incredible woman sitting right beside me. Uh, I mean, you said at those moments that you're on the reserve with those kids, you see the joy. Uh, we talk about the values of sport, and you know, it's interesting, the benefits of sport, this video that we played before our panel last night, and it included uh, para-athletes, able-bodied athletes, Special Olympics athletes, and it was all the same. It was about teamwork, it was about fair play, it was about confidence. Um, those kids that have been involved in the program, have you seen the change in them and in their life and, and their families and them be able to, to find a voice? Because that's what sport does. It allows us to understand a little more respect for others, but respect for ourselves. Yes, absolutely. And I think some of the most powerful testimonies we've received back have actually been from teachers and educators who are with the kids every day. So. Or very early on, we started to, to collect the stories and the anecdotes, anecdotal evidence from teachers who were telling us things such as, you know, when uh, on a regular day at schools, attendance is anywhere from 50 to 65 percent. When Spirit North is here, we get upwards of 85 percent of the kids coming to school. Beyond that, some of the teachers were telling us, you know, when I go out into the, into the schoolyard and play and take part in these activities with the students, sometimes it's the only positive interaction I'm having with them. Sometimes this is the only time I see this student smile or visibly feel good about themselves or speak about having learned a new skill. And those are pretty powerful testimonies. Um, we have a principal on a Métis settlement in northern Alberta who really saw the, the light, I guess, when, when we came to town because she had a young student who had um, been bounced around from foster, to various foster homes and uh, was really suffering, had, had, was um, suffering academically, suffering socially, suffering emotionally. And she actually had a box in her office for him to go when he needed to feel safe. So a place that he 
uh, would go when he, when he was feeling emotionally overwhelmed. She had never seen him smile or laugh. And we came to town and um, we got all the skis out and, she, and he was participating. Nathaniel was participating in this, in this ski day with us. And she could see that he was getting visibly agitated and upset and she was getting nervous that maybe we weren't going fast enough so we got him out on skis first. And the first thing that he did was go down a big hill, a slope that uh, led right off the <laughs> right out of the schoolyard. And uh, he put on his skis and he went down the hill and he threw up his arms and he laughed. And all the teachers cried <laughs> because they had never heard him laugh. And that's when this principal said, you know, we're onto something here. We got to do this. And she was one of our first champions of the program and brought it in, created leadership programs out of it, and really connected the dots between physical activity and physical health and mental health, and what that meant to her students, and how it advanced academic outcomes, and how it advanced their relationships with peers, how she could create leadership opportunities with them through this program, and it really blossomed from there. And I think it helped us, in a way, as an organization, see the many different platforms that sport can offer to students and to children in these communities. So I'm going to um, turn it to, to your career because you talk about um, giving joy to others and, and finding this leadership position. Um, you, for all athletes, and I'm, I don't just mean high performance athletes because when we talk about, we're talking about safe sport, which includes clean sport, um, it's for all athletes because it's a value uh, of sport. You found your leadership position. Um, did, you, did you want to be that leader? I mean, you, you found the voice and you became the voice for all sport, for drug-free sport. But how difficult was it for you uh, to take that role? Well, um, yes, it did come to me um, unwittingly, I would say. <laughs> as, as many of you know, um, I won a bronze medal in Salt Lake City at the 2002 Olympic Games and was subsequently upgraded to silver and then gold. I have had three medals for only doing one race. <laughs> and, uh, well, we're going we're gonna to ask about that, trust me. I think she's the only one. <laughs> yes. But it also threw me into um, a situation where I was, was obviously very deeply involved in anti-doping because that was, that was what had happened, that was the circumstance. And so for two years, I waited while the whole process went through the Court of Arbitration for Sport. And I think over the course of those two years, really... Um, it really galvanized my resolve and about sport and what sport is and and you know I had had this long-standing belief in sport that um, the power of sport to you know transcend barriers and connect people and the incredible stories that I can tell of of the human spirit and resilience and and all these amazing things that sport can do but um, it has to be good sport it, it has it can't be anything less than sport with integrity ethical sport with principles and sport that's done done right otherwise there's no value and um, you know over the last six years I've been chairing the World Anti-Doping Agency's Athlete Committee and been very deeply involved in anti-doping and so I see through I see in that role I see through sport through another lens and through the vulnerable place that sport is in with respect to politics and, and geopolitics in particular so it's been a there's fascinating politics and sport <laughs> really <laughs> who knew who knew um so it's been a fascinating lens through which to see sport but also to be involved and uh, it has become a, a great passion for me i guess you could say and largely because of uh having had the experience myself and now knowing you know the importance of the athletes athletes' voice at these tables, and of course the importance of athletes' rights, which often are actually overlooked at that level in sport. Now, it came upon you. You didn't sort of seek this out. Do you regret it in any way? I mean, a little bit of the world that you had to step into. It, was, um, it wasn't always easy to be in this IOC world. Uh, I'm gonna say male-dominated world, um, and to be trying to have a voice for athletes and for sport? Um, I don't know if regret is, is the word I would use. It has certainly been enlightening. And, uh, and I think it actually um, enabled me to discover probably 
a, a strength of conviction that I wasn't that I didn't know I necessarily had until I got into those rooms. It also just gave me experience that I wouldn't have had normally outside of outside of those boardrooms either. So I don't regret it. I think it's been it's been a remarkable journey. It's actually coming to an end at the end of this year because my term will end, and I have learned a lot. Um, I think there are still some unfortunate elements of sport at that level that need a lot of improvement, could change for the better. Um, but I can say that I tried my best and that I will walk away um, knowing that I, I spoke on behalf of athletes when I had the opportunity and that I advocated for sport, the kind of sport that I believe in and that I, that I, I think is worth protecting. Well, I'll tell you that, uh, you know, there were certain things, especially with Icarus coming out, if anybody has not watched the, the documentary on Netflix, it is absolutely incredible. And good word, enlightening. Uh, but you have been that voice for us. And so uh, athletes and, and the sport world thanks you for that. Um, I'm going to quickly ask about the medal ceremonies because I think, honestly, Beck is the only person who has had three ceremonies for one race. Uh, what were they like? I mean, er, people often ask. My kids asked me last night. They said, well, does she get the three medals? Does she keep them? Um, you know, it's a question that people wonder about. So tell us a little bit about it. Yes, well, I know, I, I know that people wonder that because I got that question for the last ten years. Um, certainly, they, they were fun. In fact, one was here at, at COP. <laughs> the first one was the silver medal ceremony here at Canada Olympic Park. Uh, it was organized eight months after the Olympics, and then uh, because the cases were still pending, you know, there was an uncertainty around whether or not. I would actually um, be awarded the gold. The interesting part about the whole thing is that when you, when the medal allocation, reallocation takes place, you have to actually send the first medal back. So I was living in Oregon at the time, and uh, I had to go to the post office with this bronze Olympic medal <laughs> and put it in the mail. And uh, and I was standing there because I had to fill out the customs form. And of course, there's the there's the line for value. <laughs> and I was like. How do I value a, an Olympic medal? So I was standing there for a long time, and the line behind me was growing larger and larger. And the post office gentleman finally said, "What's the problem?" And I said, "I, I don't know how to value my my package." And he said, "Well, what is it?" And I said, "It's an Olympic medal." And he said, "Yeah, right." <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, "Okay then," you know. And I put a hundred dollars or something, but <laughs> but uh, off it went into the mail. And then uh, then I came to Calgary and got a silver medal. And actually, I. I, was, I have been known to have a few superstitions in my time, and so I, I, I didn't want the silver medal, actually. I, I felt like it, this is justice halfway served. I would rather keep the bronze and, and know that justice wasn't served at all or get the gold and have justice fully served than sit somewhere in the middle with the silver medal. So following this ceremony, I actually gave the silver to my mom because I thought if I kept it, that meant I had to keep it. So I gave it to my mom and she took it home. And then about a year later, we had the gold medal ceremony in Vancouver on the steps of the art gallery. Mm, nice. Uh, well, a gold medal that you deserved right from 2002. So yes. Uh, a hard-fought battle, not just in the race, but uh, to get that medal as well. Um, now, let's turn it to kids. Um, we both have two youngish kids involved in sport. You know, we talk about clean sport. Uh, we talk about, CBC brought the case up in February about, um, you know, over 200 cases of harassment. Uh, we're always talking sport and, and, and the barriers and, and pressures and, and these situations. Are we naive to be putting our kids into sport? Um, I don't think we're naive, but I think we have to be alert to the risks that are there. And I certainly was shocked and probably like many when the CBC report came out. And as a parent of children who are in sport, certainly it did open my eyes. I never had that experience in sport, so I was, um, but that's, you know, so it was an opportunity to talk to our kids about that and to, to have those conversations. I still believe there's a lot of power in sport and I still see the value in sport and with children especially there are so many opportunities there for, for lessons and opening the doors to conversations that, that sport brings. So I don't think we can be naive to it for, for sure and there is work being done in Canada to address that. You know, It's long overdue, there's no question that this kind of power imbalance and abuse was taking place is, is totally unacceptable. But it did, and now we have to address it and make sure that our kids are, you know, that sports is always a place of, you know, safety and inclusion and ethical behavior with integrity. 
And, and you bring it up, and Your Honour brought it up about uh, safe sport. And, and it's just being released. It will be voted on by all the federal, provincial, territorials, all the FPT governments in March. There is going to be a national code of conduct. And at Sport Calgary, uh, we're very proud of our declaration. If you get a chance, take a look at it. It was after the 2019 uh, Canada Games Red Deer Declaration. It's about inclusive sport, and it's about safe sport, and it's about being accepting of everybody, regardless of gender, uh, regardless of identity, race, uh, religion, all of those. Um, and we're hoping that we can implement a recommended minimum code of conduct for local clubs because that actually doesn't exist right now. And I talked to Sport Canada about it and they said, that's what we need. So when we look at that, it's empowering not just the athletes and those that are gonna be involved in sport, but it's parents, it's coaches, it's organizations. Is education of all of those people, is that gonna help? I think education always helps. I think awareness and education are fundamental around any kind of initiative that goes forward and that's going to be imperative to, to any kind of level of success and we see that across the board in most initiatives. Um, the degree to which the education is, is extended and the engagement and uptake of that will be the key um, and, it, but it, and it can't act alone. It has to be in conjunction and collaboration with other efforts and, and I would say rules and regulations and policies as well. Education can be a, a part of it and an important part of it but it can't be the only factor. Mm. Well you know in the um in the Inclusive Sport and Recreation Conference that just finished, uh, Wayne McNeil, who partnered with Sheldon Kennedy and started the Respect Group, a uh, great partner of Sport Calgary, they talked um, about the Respect programs. There is one, a module, Keeping Girls in Sport, and they're also implementing, and I want to, uh, you know, give kudos to them, but also let everybody know that they are actually bringing out a module, uh, early 2020, and it's designed for youth, 10 to 12, and it's for the youth to allow them to get a voice. And so, my final question to you is, how important is it that we not only give the youth the voice and let them know that that voice is valued, but coaches as well. So, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. No, just the fact that how, like, to give youth that power to know that they have a voice, but also allowing coaches to understand what their role is as well and giving them the voice. To have that communication, it's, it, to me it starts with a conversation. I'm just wondering your thoughts. You've seen it within the Indigenous, uh, a group that has such barriers. Um, Councillor Chahal just had a Ward 5 Sport Council meeting um, and that's in the Northeast. There's so many different barriers there than there are in the Northwest, Southeast, Southwest. So how important is it that we have the empowerment of all of the people to have a voice? Well, I think it's critical, and, and as you mentioned, coaches, I think, are often the first line of, of contact for, for athletes, for youth athletes, but also for high performance and elite athletes. Even for our program, Spirit North, it's our coaches who are on the ground leading the programs for the kids. So coaches' education is critical and key and will be fundamental to the, to the success of any program. So giving them a voice, yes, but also giving them um, the extended education and awareness and training that they need in order to implement the policies and implement the behavior and drive the culture and the cultural change that is needed in order to ensure that sport is safe and uh, fair for everyone. Okay, well, I'm looking at my watch. It's 4.35. You need to get back to Canmore uh, for, uh, for your kids' event. So, you know, on behalf of Sport Calgary, on behalf of everybody who believes in sport, um, thank you. Um, we have a special gift. Now, um, where is Lisa? Lisa oh, there's Lisa Bowes right here. Um, we are fortunate to have Lisa on our board at Sport Calgary, and she has the Lucy Tries Sports Series. Um, and so we have put together a um, Lucy Tries Soccer and Lucy Tries Hockey. Uh, she just brought out her Lucy Tries Basketball, which is uh, an incredible new book, and uh, c'est en français aussi. Uh, oui, merci pour ça. Um, so we want to say thank you for giving up your time. Um, 
we know how busy you are. Um, on behalf of all of sport, thank you for what you do. And, um, you know, we will, we will call on you many times. <laughs> that's what we do in sport, right? We, we continue to ask people to, to give up their time, and that's what you know what to do. So on behalf of Lisa and all of Sport Calgary and the entire team here, we want to uh, give these to you to give to your kids. So uh, thank, you. thank you so much, Becky, for being a part of thank this. Thank you very thank much, you. Katrina. Maybe Lucy can try cross-country skiing next. <laughs> oh, Lisa. Thanks, Becky.